So thank you so much for meeting with me, Dr. Howard Schubiner, um, probably one of my heroes. Um, you are a mind-body medical doctor in the United States, in Detroit, in Michigan, and Dr. Howard Schubiner wrote, I, I'm aware of three books that you've written. One is Unlearn Your Pain, which is the book that changed my life. And you wrote another book called Unlearn Your Anxiety and Depression. Right. <laughs> and, and another book, I think you wrote one for medical practitioners. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I think my, uh, my doctor, I told my doctor about that book and I think she went and bought it. When I first got your Unlearn Your Pain book, I used to carry it around with me everywhere. And either I was telling people about it or I was just reading the information, just taking it in over and over again and, and allowing it in. So, yeah. Well, it was kind of heavy. It's a heavy book, though. It was so heavy. I took it, <laughs> I took it to Bali. I was, <laughs> I was there for a while. And um, actually what I did is I left it in one of the hostels I stayed in. They had a bookcase with lots of different books from around the world. And I left it as a, a gift for someone to buy. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I wonder if anyone. I wonder what happened to it. I know. I sometimes I think. I wonder who who's found it. I'm sure it will find the right person. Um. So yeah, is there anything you'd like to add to your uh, introduction and to say who you are, what you do? No, I'm a I'm an internal medicine physician, and uh, I see patients for uh, chronic pain and uh, chronic fatigue and anxiety and depression. Um, things that are generally caused by the brain. And, um, and I help to do research in this area. Amazing. I actually, I think it was on the Curable app. It was the Curable app where I found you. And I think it was you who was sharing about um, some research that you did. Um, was it with a young boy and you, you did some scans on the brain and he was experiencing a lot of stomach pain. Correct me if this was not you, but the words you used was when you scanned his brain, his brain was lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> I think that, well, that, that patient was treated by my colleague, Alan Gordon in Los Angeles. And uh, he did a fMRI of that uh, young man's brain. And uh, it was interpreted as being quite abnormal when he was in chronic pain and then he got out of pain and then they repeated the scan and the scan had returned to normal. So it was a really nice demonstration of the fact that the pain that he was experiencing was not coming from his stomach, it was coming from his brain. And when the pain changed, his brain changed or vice versa, it's hard to know what came first, but uh, the, our brains create what we experience. And uh, that is a revolutionary statement that most people and most doctors don't really understand. Uh, our brains create what we experience. So if someone has pain, it means their brain is creating that pain. It, the brain can certainly respond to an injury and create pain, but not all injuries cause pain. So there's a point at which the brain decides whether to turn on pain or not when there's an injury. And just thinking of it that way is really important, different concept than assuming that all injuries would cause pain. You know, the vast majority of injuries do cause pain for certain, but each time there is pain, the brain is activating pain. And the most important thing that, again, most people and most doctors don't understand is that stress and emotions activate the same exact parts of the brain as does a physical injury. So the brain can and often does activate pain or other symptoms like fatigue, anxiety, depression, et cetera, insomnia. <clears throat> the brain will often activate those uh, sensations when someone is under stress uh, someone is feeling, feeling strong emotions. And those symptoms are real. They're not imaginary because all pain is caused by the brain. And so therefore the pain that occurs due to an injury 
and the pain that occurs through distress and emotions is exactly the same. So <clears throat> people, if people could understand that, it would be a vast revolutionary change in our understanding of what of what pain is and what fatigue is and anxiety and depression and insomnia and all sorts of other common symptoms like tinnitus and vertigo and urinary urgency and uh, muscle tics and spasms and tingling and numbness and all sorts of sensations that people commonly get in the body. Wow. Yeah, you're less like listing off so many things that are familiar to me. Um, and so and I experienced pain from a really young age. I had um, stomach pain, actually, that was my main thing. And then and low immune system as well, which um, I connect to stress, right? Um, but I also had something called um, pyrexia of unknown origin. So my body would go into a really high fever. Mm -hmm. wow. and so, and I, I also had aches and pains through my arms and legs. So I had like the symptoms of what I was later diagnosed with as fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. This was all going on from like three, four or five years old. And that's really when my journey of going to consultants and, and alternative practitioners, my parents were super open and, and um, I just saw every single kind of healer and every single kind of helper um, around the world because we were living in London. So I was in London, I was in Ireland, I traveled to Australia as an adult looking for solutions. And it was just this moment when I found that curable app and the, I heard like your, your words, um, the reign of pain lays mainly in the brain. Uh -huh. <laughs> and <laughs> that's like one of my favorite quotes. And then also um, phantom leg pain. This is what really just, really it just everything made so much sense to me when I heard that people still experienced pain and like limbs that weren't even there. Mm -hmm. so from that moment on for me I knew where to go like where to pour all this energy all this seeking all this searching was to like pour it into this brain and the nervous system education yeah well what's amazing is that um, once you understand these concepts all of a sudden so many things can make sense you know about your experience and your life and when a child is having those kinds of symptoms, the parents are assuming there's something wrong with the child and take the child to get treatment. But more likely, it's the child's environment which is the problem. There's something going on in the child's environment, in their family, in their life, in their school, and somewhere in their neighborhood, something that's making them feel uh, unsafe. Uh, making them feel like the world is unsafe or something is wrong or something is scary or, or you know, they're, they're at risk somehow. And if, if we can figure out what that is and solve that problem and calm that problem and teach the child that they actually are okay or fix the problem that's causing them to feel unsafe, then the symptoms will go away. It's magic. <laughs> it, it really it is magic it's like science is magic um and but something else that that you that I heard you speak about that really changed my life as well is being a highly sensitive person and the the women who I end up working with because I'm so sensitive like I'm just was always so sensitive I could feel energies and feel other people and and I always knew I was sensitive, but I saw it as a problem and something to try and like harden myself and get tough. And, and I just I had no tools. And then when I heard you speak about being a highly a sensitive person and how your maybe that makes the, your nervous system or your amygdala is more sensitive, or maybe it's more active. Because what I see is with highly sensitive people, like you're taking in a lot of information and I guess a lot of information is processed through the nervous system and the amygdala all the information of the people around you and senses and everything so yeah 
Yeah, people, uh, some people are born more sensitive than others. I mean, that's that's a fact. That's just true. Some people have different temperaments coming right out of the of the womb, so to speak. Uh, and temperament can also be learned. And so people who uh, children brought up in environments like I was saying before that feel scary or unsafe, they learn to be on edge. They learn to be on guard. You know, anyone would. I mean, that's normal. It's a normal, normal and, and health, healthy uh, adaption. Uh, and so in part, it, it certainly can be helpful to learn how to uh, tamp down, like you say, harden yourself a little bit, you know, learn to be a little bit more uh, tolerant and able to tolerate uh, those sensations and realize that you're not actually in danger now, even though you might have been in danger when you were younger. Um, but also, I think what we're, what we're helping people understand that when someone has these kinds of reactions, it's a message. It's a message that's coming from their brain. And the brain doesn't speak English, so the brain may not be able to say, you know, my dear, uh, something is really bothering you, or my dear, you're just really overly sensitive to the sound or light or whatever, and you can teach yourself how not to be so sensitive, or you can, or you can uh, help to deal with the situation that's going on in your life. But in essence, it's a gift, because it's a message, it's a gift, it's, it's pointing us to something. And I think what's really uh, missed sometimes is that when people, and of course it makes sense, if you're in pain and the pain is real and the pain is severe and the pain is debilitating or the fatigue or the anxiety or the depression or the insomnia is so troublesome or all the other symptoms are so troublesome, you just want to get rid of them. You just want to get out of there. Um, but if you can begin to see it as a message, as something that you know, your brain needs to learn how to calm down, your brain needs to learn how to relax, and you, but you're also, but you also need to learn some things. Maybe you need to learn to be more, um, more powerful in your life. Maybe you need to be able to speak something that's on your mind. Maybe you need to be able to take care of yourself and take time for yourself and put yourself first every now and then. Maybe you need to be able to say no sometimes. Maybe you need to be able to forgive something uh, that has been troubling you. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of messages. And the goal here is not to just get people to get rid of their pain or their fatigue or their other symptoms. The goal is to help them grow as a person and be healthier and happier and, and have more agency and more uh, sense of control over their life, more sense of who they are and what's important to them, more sense of moving forward in the world with confidence and ease. That's the goal. And when you can do that, then the messenger turns off, the pain or the other symptoms turns off because it was just there as, as a message. I love this so much. And so if you had have said this to me when I was like in bed, debilitated, like suicidal, depressed, anxious, so sick for so long, all I wanted was the symptoms to go, right? That's just all you care about and all you think about. But, and I share this so much, what you get is so much better. It's so much richer because what I've gotten in the past few, couple of years of using this kind of healing is yeah just such a transformation of my life and my relationships and um just so much more love so much more power so much more agency um so yeah but when you're in it it's just like you just all I talked about was my symptoms all I thought about were my symptoms and if you can now I can see like the, the obsession but uh, all I wanted was for them to go but um yeah, it's just really a beautiful journey when I can see now the invitation, like it's like an invitation for change, like a, a message. And like you shared, it's literally just like, I had no clue how to look after myself. I was like a giver, being this like sensitive, like woman, Irish, cultural, all kinds of things. It's like you give, 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 and you do not receive like you don't receive a compliment you don't receive money you don't receive anything you just give everything away all your energy and you're just here to serve 
and and then you're just sick and burnt out and also really angry and really resentful and yeah I didn't think these were all the same thing as health I thought I knew I had like you know like relationship problems and maybe some anger issues and held a grudge and then I had all these different health problems as well which also felt like separate things that like Mm -hmm. had urinary urgency the fibromyalgia depression all these different things I felt like I was treating so life was really complicated I'm not surprised I couldn't get out of bed (laughs) Like it was really hard and really complicated. And just through, through going through this journey, it's just felt like that minute I heard that, that information, everything just went, just very simplified. And wow, I just need to, so often for me as a highly sensitive person, it is actually, I, because I am naturally altruistic and want to ch- serve and can sense what people need, I really often if I do get a twinge or a pain or something back it is I just need to do something for myself I need to go and see a friend I need to laugh I need to do something playful like have fun it's so it just seems so simple but it it just was not how I learned to be right because the brain has two major modes danger or safety you know fear or love uh, you know, worry, uh, frustration, or playfulness and joy. Uh, you know, crisis or awe. And so shifting, and it's 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 kind of a simple process in a lot of ways, but it's also not easy because these patterns are often so ingrained and so so learned and so deeply held. And many people are very trapped in their lives. They may be trapped in, in poverty, in, in jobs that are demeaning, in relationships that are, that are difficult, or um, you know, in with certain family members. There's just so many ways that, that people suffer emotionally uh, and, and in, their, in their lives. And, you know, our brain is there to protect us. So our brain it wants you to be safe. But sometimes, like in your case, your brain, the message your brain was telling you was stay in bed. You know, don't get out of bed. Don't go out in the world. Don't do anything because the world is, is bad. The world is dangerous. The world is, is messing with you. The world is giving you a hard time. And the only way to, to be safe is to, is to curl up under the covers. And that's the message. That's what all that pain and all those other symptoms were doing to you. They were forcing you to stop. Which, you know, when someone has a severe and catastrophic injury, physical injury, that's exactly what you should be doing. You should stop and rest. So the brain is doing its job. <laughs> that's that's what it that's what it wants you to do. Uh, but it's it's interpreting the uh, the stress as the emotional stress in a way, the same way that it would interpret a physical, a physical injury. And that is the key message that we need to understand so that we can help people. Um, you know, you, when you learned about this information, it made sense to you and you were able to incorporate it and begin to use it, but not everybody can do that. Um, not, it's, it's sometimes very, very hard. As you pointed out, you get so obsessed with the feelings that you're having. And that's all, that's all you can think about because that's all on your mind. And it takes a lot of courage and, and insight and, and strength uh, to, to look outside, to go outside of that, uh, you know, the pain itself and to see something different, see it in a different way, see a different future. Yeah, and um, so something I, a massive thing for me was food. Um, and this is really common, obviously, if you have severe stomach problems, it makes sense also to, to blame food or to look at food. And when I was a kid, we tried out different like uh, sugar free, wheat free, different yeah. things. And as an as a young adult, then I really took this on and I found that I had candida. So I I didn't eat sugar, gluten, all these different things. You know, you've probably seen it a million times. And yeah, the list was so long. I couldn't eat at certain times of the day. 
And I, and when I, when I tried to have these foods, I had a real reaction. Like it, it was what I've now I've heard about from Dr. Sarno's work is the nocebo. So like the brain, because like you were saying, our brain is trained to protect us. And so I would get all this information and I would read it and I'd say, okay, gluten is bad. Gluten is bad. And I would tell my brain Mm -hmm. gluten is bad. And, and I was creating all these loops and I was, you know, I was, I was just making such efforts to try and get better and get stronger. And I eventually was like stuck in this place where everything was a trigger Right. all these different foods all these different things and I had uh, all these supplements I was taking and and something that I I just I just didn't want to be that person anymore so I wanted to be someone who could walk into a bar and have a pint of Guinness okay because Guinness I'm in Ireland right this is what got me through this is actually was what changed everything for me I had got the information from you guys but then I wanted to be someone who could order a pint of Guinness and eat fish and chips right exactly (laughs) I didn't want to be this health freak anymore I didn't want to be this person who knew everything about like food and nutrition and I'm like he was hiding under the covers and like that kind of just like gave me this push um, I just wanted to be that person that wasn't, and I used to imagine myself doing that. I just get a pint and like, without thinking about it, because I'd be like, oh, where am I now? Like, what, what temperature is it? What fabrics am I wearing? Like, I was allergic to everything. I just didn't want to sort of imagine myself. Like, I just want to be this, like, carefree, more carefree person that can have a pint and fish and chips. <laughs> Right. And then I did it one day. I, I spent two weeks. I ordered your book. I did the curable app. And like, like the obsessive perfectionist that I am, I was like going crazy like <laughs> with your book. And then I just stood up and I walked to my local shop and I ordered a packet of Guinness and, I, and a, a box of Mars bar ice creams because no one had seen me eat sugar in like nearly a decade I was all the health freak and the Mars bar ice cream is just like so I just really wanted to eat one and I ate them and I drank the Guinness and I was totally fine when I happened I just like overrode this is the program yeah yeah I mean there's science behind that because these are conditioned responses these are learned learned behaviors and neurons that 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 fire together will wire together and so when one starts to be fearful of gluten or sugar or uh, fabrics or all these things, the brain learns that these are dangerous. And then the brain actually is creating the real sensations, the real reactions when exposed to those triggers. Uh, but you can unwind those and unravel those and deactivate those neural circuits by changing the relationship you have to the stimulus. And one of the things we work a lot with, which which is what you did, is you imagined being different. You know, you started training your brain by imagining having a Guinness, by imagining eating some ice cream with joy, instead of imagining and knowing that these are dangerous and and going into them with fear. And when you when you when you shift from this fear these fear pathways in the brain to safety pathways and joy pathways that's a really powerful thing and it's amazing how quickly those things can change when you you know it's like an old joke you know a woman walks into a bar and orders a guinness and it's like yay (laughs) that's amazing (laughs) but it takes a lot of courage and strength you know to do that it takes it takes conviction and confidence and that's what we're trying to give people so they can really understand that they're not in danger that these foods you know, so many people on what I call a fear food diet. And so everything is so fearful. Uh, and it, it just becomes an obsession. And the worry feeds on the worry and it gets worse and worse over time. But yeah, I have a, I have a patient who the only foods he could eat for three years were, I think, chicken and rice. Every other food was causing severe headaches, severe itching, severe reactions, severe nerve, nerve zappy reactions. I mean, these severe reactions that keep them up all night. And then, 
and he was on this uh, website for uh, mass mass cell activation syndrome MCAS, where there's he said there was a hundred thousand people on this website all convinced that their body was reacting to all these different foods and chemicals and smells and touches, etc. And now he can eat any food that he wants. Uh, and he went back on the website to explain, like, hey, this, you know, you can get better. There's things you can do that, you know, these this mind-body treatment is really powerful and can really help people. And he said, now there weren't 100,000 people on that website. There were 200,000 people. So the list is growing the number of people with these, you know, mind-body disorders is growing exponentially. Uh, and it's spreading worldwide because of all this fear of fear of foods, fear of, of you know, fabrics, fears of smells, fears of chemicals, fears of electromagnetic radiation, I mean, all sorts of things, uh, fears of COVID. And, um, and so the response to the people on the website was to kick them off the website. We don't want to hear this information. It was it was sad. He was really hurt by it. And he's like, hey, I can help you guys. You know, it really helped me. And they're like, no, it's no, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, I I was just smiling, not because it's actually funny, but but it's happened to me loads of times. Um and um I yeah, it it has happened to me lots where I've gone into face Facebook groups. There's hundreds of thousands of people with with um fibromyalgia. And it was just at the beginning of, and I was like, hey guys, like, let me tell you how I can help you. And, and I go, I'm barred from like, <laughs> I'm barred from all those Facebook groups. I'm, I'm not allowed in, but I've also learned as well to be um, just so much more sensitive and res responsive and to, to where people, where someone is at as well. That's that helped me because you're so excited at the at the when you first find this out you just want to you just want to tell everyone and um, and yeah. but it is um I guess it is a bit threatening as well to to someone um to someone's brain or subconscious when they're 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 because the the symptoms are serving a purpose in a sense they're like protecting you and so it's also and then you're you're already quite activated so right i mean the problem is is that people often feel invalidated they feel like they're not being heard they feel like what when you say it's a mind body problem you're saying in essence that it's not real that it's imaginary that it's fake that it's their fault that they're crazy and you know that's not what people need none of that is true none of that is true at all and people definitely don't want to hear that it's very damaging to have people say and and people who have these problems have been told that many times by family members sometimes by doctors and so they get caught in the cycle of either it's fake and phony and they're crazy which is ridiculous and wrong and horrible or it's it's real but it's incurable they're stuck you know it's a, a horrible disease that could never be fixed because there's no treatment for it and what we're saying is there's a middle ground there's a way of understanding that it is real and it is not a horrible incurable disease and there's treatment for it and it's not that hard and you you can do it yourself to a large degree by changing your mindset, changing your understanding of what the symptoms represent. And this is all based on science. It's all based on good neuroscience. It's not voodoo or, or it's not magic. It's magical sometimes. It feels like it can be magical because it's so effective uh, so often, but, um, but it's, it's just real science. It's just good medicine. So it's, it's hard, you know, and, and it's depressing sometimes when you know when you, you have something that you might you love to help people and you have found something that could help people and then they don't want to hear it <laughs> then you know it's the same for all of us it is i know but um oh something i actually that came to mind that you shared as well because i know that you help people with depression and i didn't actually read your unlearn your depression and anxiety book but 
I'm pretty sure I heard you or one of the other guys on Curable share about um, the brain chemistry. And this really, really blew my mind and helped me and still does. If I get down in my mood a bit, I know now that my nervous system is, is overstimulated, it's stressed. And that's the only narrative I now have to like a low mood um, or anxiety. And I'm like, right, so there's all, what do you need to do? What do I say to myself? Like, what do I need to do now? Like, do I need to feel safe and like rest and snuggle down? Or do I need to like get some company and go play or ask for support? But I now know what that is. But before finding you guys, I was, you know, trying everything. And I have had an incredible, beautiful therapists, like psychoanalysts and really beautiful people in my life, like analyzing my thoughts and my relationship. And, and then I was also on SSRIs. There was a point where I was on SSRIs xanax and valium all at once like it tried a day it was a short period of my life but i had had some big stuff happen it was it was like you know just rock rock bottom but um but this information about how like the oxytocin and like so also when i feel lonely i do this also i'm like oh it's just like my oxytocin is down you know so i'm like i i don't even necessarily need to call upon some company I, I just need to like re relax and take care of myself and and so yeah that that for me was just so huge and I'd love to hear you share a bit about that yeah well um the what's happened is that uh the world of psychiatry had developed a split there was the the part of psychiatry that was psychological psychologically oriented and thinking what you were talking about how when you're down there must be a reason and uh, the reason lies in your life it lies in your past it lies in all this stuff but people had a strong reaction to Freud because Freud made a lot of mistakes and some of the stuff that he said was was outlandish and not not helpful even though the core of what he said was was actually true um, and so there's a reaction to that and psychiatrists then move toward what we're calling biological psychiatry, where they were saying, well, depression is a disease of the brain. There's a disease of the brain. Look at the patterns in the brain. Like, you know, we saw with that young boy with pain, his brain was different. There's no question your brain is different when you're depressed or anxious than when you're not. But from our point of view, this is a reversible thing. It's not an incurable brain disease. It's not because there's it's all genetic, it's all inflammation, it's all neurotransmitters. And it turns out that, you know, so then they developed this theory that serotonin was low in people with depression, so they need to raise their serotonin. That's why we have these SSRI medications. But that theory was never proved. It wasn't a scientific theory. It was just based on the idea, well, these medications seem to work, so serotonin must be low because people get better. And it turns out there's a medication that actually lowers serotonin. And that medication was just as effective for depression as the medications that raise serotonin. So it's not the serotonin. The people's brains are not actually physically damaged. They're altered. The neural circuits are different, but that's the same way that the neural circuits are different in people with chronic pain where there's no physical injury. So, so when you put all that in, we, we know that the placebo effect for people with antidepressants is just as powerful as the medication effect. For the most part so what we found is that you can help people with depression and anxiety in the same way that you can help them with chronic pain when you diagnose there's no medical disease i mean some people with anxiety have uh you know a, a rhythm of the heart and they need heart treatment some people have hyperthyroidism they need thyroid treatment that can cause anxiety some people with depression have some men for example have very very low testosterone levels. it's abnormal and they need to be treated but you know, for the most part, these are what I would call neural circuit or mind-body problems. So, uh, you know, this challenges a lot of what is happening in medicine. It challenges what's happening in the field of biological psychiatry, where people are being told that they're going to be depressed their whole life. They're never going to get better uh, because their brain is damaged. And, you know, we think that's completely wrong. 
And people with chronic pain are, have been told or being told by physicians and pain specialists that you're going to have pain the rest of your life, that it's incurable. And that's completely wrong as well from our point of view. So it's, it's really, there's a, there's a conflict here between ways of thinking about how the body works, how the brain works, you know, what all these things are. And, and these conditions, these painful conditions, you know, when you take anxiety, depression, and chronic pain, you have the vast majority of the major problems that people in the world face that are not things that will kill you. You know, or that are not um, cancer and heart disease and stroke and diabetes, the things that are, you know, physical diseases that have mortality associated with them. But these have tremendous morbidity associated with them. Uh, that is the major causes of, of suffering in the world now. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah, just such a painful place to be um, feeling trapped without a solution. And I, I had the 30 years of searching the world and speaking to people everywhere looking for help. And um, I was kind of just forced into making up my own theories and I had all different theories like that. Um, I would come up with, but there was really just nothing else for me. Um, and I've, um, but I've also heard I I never used painkillers because um, I was really determined. I just had an obsession with with finding a way, even though people kept telling me I was crazy and you know just like I, coming up with all these theories, which now I look back were pretty wild, but. Yeah, I just had no other choice. But um, yeah, I've heard also that people do go on strong painkillers and then um, and they don't work after a while. That there's like a lot of opioids being um being prescribed. And actually, I had a friend. I have a friend who's a she was a paramedic in London, and she said she would get people with like fibromyalgia, and they would eventually they would they didn't even respond to the opioids. Um, so the pain, if it's in your brain, maybe there's no painkiller that can override that if it's that strong. Yeah, the uh, painkillers, um, it's an interesting phenomenon because anytime you take a medication, there's going to be two components to it. One is the, the physiologic component of how the medication works in your body or in your brain. Uh, but then there's also going to be the placebo effect, the part of the, the part of the treatment that will make you feel better because you expect to feel better, and your brain has been conditioned to feel better when you take a pill. Um, and then, as you pointed out a little bit earlier, there's a nocebo effect. It can be the opposite. Some people, when they take a pill, they get more side effects. And so, if you look at, uh, for example, um, the uh, re research. Um, um, when me a new medication is used, they give the medication to half the people and they give a placebo medication to the other half of people. And in the placebo group, there's often large uh, amounts of people who get stomach pain or headache or dizziness or, or a weakness or fatigue or a whole variety of symptoms due to just taking the placebo pill. So the brain is powerful. And that's true with the COVID vaccine. So we've seen, if you look at the reactions to the COVID vaccine, in the research trials, half the people in these trials got the placebo vaccine. Well, the side effects due to that placebo vaccine can be quite striking and can be quite severe because of fear, because of people, not consciously, but subconsciously, their brain uh, has been conditioned uh, to be afraid. Um, so when someone takes a pain pill, there's a, there's a lot going on. And uh, so their expectations, their subconscious brain is going to affect how well the pain medication works. But in terms of opiates, there's never been any research to show that chronic opioid prescription helps actually reduce pain in the long run. Uh, for people with, who've had an acute injury after surgery, uh, opiates can be helpful in reducing acute pain. But used in the chronic situation, they have not been found to be helpful. And obviously, they can cause uh, a certain amount of addiction, certainly, and can people can really get in trouble because you know there's if if they if they're taking prescription opioids and then they can't get them or they're not working, then they 
may start using medications they get illegally. And the medications you get illegally are often very dangerous, you know, laced with fentanyl and other, other products that can kill you uh, instantly. Very, very scary situation. Very scary. Um, I seem to remember another thing that I've heard you say. Um, did you say, um, and it's to do with like placebo and the mind power with, with creating symptoms. And was it you who shared in medical school when students are learning about um, learning about diseases that they start to get the symptoms? Yeah, certainly that's it's very common. We call it medical studentitis. So, uh, yeah, we see it all the time. And because people are people, you know, there's one of the things that's kind of interesting about this work is people always ask, well, why would the brain choose to create pain in one area versus another area? Uh, because any of them can serve as a messenger. Anyone can serve as a warning or an alarm, like a smoke alarm. Why would one person get anxiety and the other person get headache? Why would one person get irritable bowel and the other person get fatigue? Why would one person get back pain and the other person get depression? So, um, well, you know, when I when I think about it, I think about it in a variety of ways. One time, sometimes the brain will produce something that runs in the family. So if a parent had headaches or a parent had back pain, the, 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 you know, the child or whatever age they are, uh, their brain might create that as just the brain thinks, oh yeah, well, that makes sense. It runs in the family. Or um, if it's, uh, you know, they're, they're doing something like, if they're doing a lot of typing and they're using their eyes a lot, their brain might cause hand pain or they might cause eye strain. Uh, or, or if they're bending over a lot, their brain might cause back pain, even though typing and looking at computer screens are really not dangerous. People make them into all these dangerous things, but they're not. Um, so, and if you had an injury, if you had an injury in the past, you know, you, you damage your elbow and it healed, but then when you're under stress, your elbow might start hurting again. Or if you, you know, uh, you know, things like that. And then, um, Sometimes the, the pain can be symbolic. So if you have pain in your side, it might someone's a thorn in your side in your life, or if you have pain in the neck, someone's a pain in your neck, or if you have foot pain, maybe there's something you can't stand in your life, those kind of things. It's actually amazingly common. Um, and then it can be contagious. And that's that's what we're talking about here, where symptoms can be contagious. You read about them, like in medical school or you're reading articles about them in the, in the newspaper, you know people who have them and then you can get them, your brain can just very easily latch onto that. And, and that's in part why some of these, some of these mind-body symptoms will go in waves, will go in cycles, that will they'll become sort of fashionable, so to speak. And this is, these are not conscious reactions, but um, if you look very carefully at long COVID, uh, I think you will find that even though there's a lot of things going on, uh, there's uh, you know, one study in France showed that people with long COVID were more likely to not have been to not have had COVID than people who didn't have long COVID. And so, if you can get long COVID and you haven't actually had COVID, but all the symptoms are the same and all the symptoms are real and can be severe, uh, you, people cannot get out of you know. So fatigued, they can't get out of bed. So brain battles that they're, that they can't think straight. And that can all be due to neural circuits in the brain. It's mind boggling. It's hard for people to believe, uh, but yet we see it all the time. It, it's just so incredible to me that all of this. Um, and so I'm actually do find myself being very careful about what I listen when someone starts to tell me about, um, you know, a bit story of pain. I'm like, mm. <laughs> so I am. Um, I start to get really careful about that. But one thing that I never ever got was was back pain, and um, just really interested me. It's because for me and my mind or whatever, it, I never cared so much about it. And whereas, yeah, in my family, and um, there was stomach pain was a problem. But sometimes, like. Or I never really got headaches because I didn't really care about them. But sometimes I say to people, I probably did get headaches, but I just didn't care. 
didn't care about it, but I cared about like the sleep or the stomach or the other things just because the more I, I cared about it, the more it kind of disturbed me. So I feel like that is very different from person to person. What's going to worry you? Like maybe if it's, yeah, like it was going to threaten your job or like uh, someone I know I was uh, sharing with her about like sleep things. And she said, well, she knows she has loads of kids. She was like, I haven't slept in years. I don't care. <laughs> it's like, oh, you just don't care. And <laughs> that's the difference. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you don't sleep well one night and you think that's going to ruin your life, you won't be able to concentrate, you won't be able to work, you won't be able to function, then the next night when you go to sleep, you're going to be more afraid of not sleeping, which is going to create the pattern in your brain to make it less likely that you actually will sleep. And then it just can feed on itself. Yeah. You worry about the symptom itself. And something else that you say, I could probably quote your whole entire book at this point, but I'm like, something else that you say that I love is um, the symptoms are the last thing to go. You say like, it's when you just stop caring about them. And also along the same line, um, when your focus is, becomes like joy and play and how to live your life instead of the symptoms and being sick it's like it's like there's two different paths it was like you can keep worrying about being sick and keep practicing that almost in your mind over and over again or you can like take this new road of them yeah yeah, yeah exactly it's amazing how the brain can change how it can be so powerful to create such kind of a living hell sometimes and how it can be relieved and how it can live in 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 you know it sounds silly, but joy and happiness, you know, uh, not, you know, we, we've learned over the years that having more money doesn't necessarily make someone happier. Uh, and so it's really this kind of inner, inner safety, inner peace, inner calm, you know, where someone can have five kids and not be sleeping and still feel like, okay, I'm okay. This is, this is my life and my life is okay. This is what I'm doing. This is my purpose. This is my meaning and I can handle it. It's not stress that actually causes people to decompensate. It's the feeling that they can't handle the stress. And that's why the work of Viktor Frankl, the you know famous psychiatrist who was in prison in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II was so valuable, even though his book, Man's Search for Meaning was written, I think in the early 1950s. Uh, because he describes how you, no one can make you change your mind. No one can control what you think or how you think or how you think about things and how you think about yourself, um, no matter what your external circumstances are. And, and so many people are in external circumstances that are difficult. There is no question about that. So many people. Um, but yet, if they're able to find meaning and purpose in their life, if they're able to keep going and be the hero to their to themselves, be the hero to their family, be the hero to their kids by handling the difficulties that they have and finding a way to be uh, positive, finding a way to be to be joyous even, finding a way to find awe in life and find meaning in what they're doing. If, they, if people can do that, it's, it can help so much in terms of calming their brain and helping them feel better in their body as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Like, I just, yeah, I'm so, 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 so grateful for all of the wisdom that you've shared and your books and yeah, just this message that you bravely have been sharing. Um, yeah, I'm just so grateful to you. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to actually tell you this, tell you how grateful I am. <laughs> I told you in a few emails, but it, it's better like this. Um, so yeah, well, thank, thank you. <laughs> very kind. Those words are very meaningful. And, uh, you know, they give us all hope and they give me hope and inspiration to keep going and to keep uh, you know, trying to make sure that this information does get out to people. And, you know, sometimes it's a book that you find on a bookshelf in a hostel, you know, in Bali. <laughs> sometimes it's a, it's a website or, a, or an app uh, that 
kind of pops up on your on your feed uh, in online and sometimes it's just uh, an article in the newspaper or, or something that somebody mentions a friend or a colleague or even sometimes a stranger i've seen this where people learn about this work in uh, so many odd and different ways but sometimes it's just it's a seed that actually grows because they're open to it they're ripe to it they're ready to hear it and sometimes they're so desperate that they've tried everything else that hasn't worked. Yeah, it is. I relate to that desperation, definitely. Um, and yeah, what I did was I just kept listening. I, I searched for your name on YouTube and I found some talks you gave in Google. And I just kept listening. A first thing in the morning, I would wake up and I just like, put like this information, <laughs> like whatever you're, you were talking about or on the herbal app. So just just allowing it in um, was really just my method to begin with. So uh, if this helps anyone today, just hearing this information, it's so soothing as well when you've been in so much fear, just to hear this information or to hear someone else's story. Right. Well, thank you for interviewing me. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you for helping to make this knowledge known. Oh my God, thank you. <laughs> it's so, yeah, it's so beautiful. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day in Detroit, Michigan. I've never been there before. I know music and cars and I don't really know anything else, but. I've been to Ireland twice, so it's a you beautiful, have. beautiful country. I love Ireland. I love, I love just hearing people speak. I mean, I just love listening to folks there and I love playing golf there and I love um you know Guinness and Murphy's and uh Smithic, you know all the <laughs> all the great tastes <laughs> oh my god that's so amazing yeah it's so magical talk about magic it's really magical and beautiful here but most people don't come because it's it is very cold and very windy <laughs> but um it's yeah there's a lot of magic here so yeah I'm hoping to uh, get this message actually um, to more people here in Ireland because um, yeah so thank you for helping me I can't say thank you enough you might get some more emails saying thank you um, <laughs> along the, the, the timeline um, but yeah enjoy the rest of your day and I might speak to you again sometime you take care <laughs> thanks